Clapham Common. A triangular stretch of green parkland straddling the boundary between the boroughs of Lambeth and Wandsworth in South London. It is one of the larger green spaces south of the Thames, accompanying Battersea Park, Brockwell Park, Burgess Park, Richmond Park, the largest, and many more. However, the common is more than just a patch of grass with trees planted around it, overlooked by passers-by on their way to work. At its heart lies the largest bandstand in London, remnants of old World War II anti-air gun platforms lie scattered across it, and disused bomb shelters, also from the time of World War II, rest across the road of both of Clapham Common's underground stations. All of these have histories in their own right, but I shall focus on something entirely different. Nestled in the northeast corner of Clapham Common, close to its northerly underground station, and the quaint Old Town, lies a disused but imposing granite and bronze water fountain dating back to the late 19th century. What is its history? What relevance does it have in today's world? And why does it now only serve its purpose as a bench? Watch on to find out more. Jin, cursed fiend, with fury wrought, makes human race a prey. It enters by a deadly draught and steals our life away. These were among the words written below the famous Jin Lane by painter and editorial cartoonist William Hogarth during the so-called Jin craze in the first half of the 18th century. In the late 17th century, the British government permitted unlicensed gin production as an alternative to French brandy which they heavily curtailed imports of as a way to disassociate themselves from France at a time when both countries were in political and regional conflict. This paved the way for a larger market for poorer quality barley, unfit for beer production, that could be used in gin brewing. Due to its low prices compared to many other popular drinks, gin became a favoured beverage of the working classes and directly led into the gin craze. This period, rife as a result with widespread drunkenness endemic across the UK, London in particular, motivated the government to introduce multiple gin acts to curb its usage. While initial acts were unsuccessful, the 1751 Gin Act lowered license fees but required gin distillers to trade from properties rented for at least £10 a year, or 2300 in today's money. This improbable addition to rising grain costs led to the decline of the gin craze, which the government would try to ensure by halting spirit production from domestic grain. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Sometime later in the early 19th century, the temperance movement began to gather steam in the US, following multiple failed attempts in the 18th and 19th centuries, primarily campaigning against the consumption of alcohol. But the first British temperance organisation to be founded was the Glasgow and West of Scotland Temperance Society in 1829. John Dunlop, the society's founder and attributed as the father of the temperance societies of Great Britain, had published a study in the same year entitled On the Extent and Remedy of National Intemperance, which, being the first transnational temperance study, triggered the immediate and extensive growth of British temperance societies. Later, in 1859, the Metropolitan Drinking Fountain Association, later renamed to the Metropolitan Drinking Fountain and Cattle Trough Association in 1867, was founded by Samuel Gurney and Edward Thomas Wakefield as a means to provide free drinking water to the British public. This was aided by the Metropolis Water Act 1852, which helped to improve London's infamously terrible water quality. The most imposing fountains built by them were the Baroness Burdett Coates Drinking Fountain in Victoria Park and the Buxton Memorial Fountain in Victoria Tower Gardens, the latter of which commemorates the 1834 emancipation of slaves in the British Empire. Though the association was independently funded by Gurney himself, it nevertheless garnered association with evangelical Christianity and the temperance movement with the latter giving rise to the name Temperance Fountains. Many such temperance fountains were erected across London and the UK, mainly across from public houses, to encourage the poor to abstain from alcoholism by drinking fresh water instead. Now, bringing the focus back to Clapham Common's Temperance Fountain, it was first commissioned in 1884 for the exterior of the London Bridge offices of UK Temperance and General Provident Institution, which later changed its name to UK Provident Institution, which was later absorbed into Friends Provident, which later changed its name to Friends Life, which was later absorbed by Aviva. This fountain was not actually given to Clapham until 1895, as the fountain's sheer weight caused the bridge's arches to develop cracks and actually started structurally damaging the underlying warehouses. So it was decided to move the fountain entirely to its current location. The statue on top depicts a woman giving water to a beggar, and was cast by F. Miller of Munich from a sculpture by August von Krilling, both known for designing the Tyler Davidson Fountain in Cincinnati, Ohio. As the temperance movement declined during the 20th century, 
so too do the novelty of architecturally imposing drinking fountains. And with the founding of London County Council and later the Greater London Council, local authorities levied maintenance of these fountains. And in addition to the fact that many were unsanitary, fountains had their water supply turned off and became disused, including the Clapham one, which also had its protruding basins permanently covered to presumably prevent them from being used as toilets. Rather unfitting for a monument such as this. So there you have it. One more historic landmark to add to the drinking fountain of reasons that Clapham Common is a hidden emerald. I mean, green gem. Hope you enjoyed.